So Dr. Allred is the chief of uh, electrophysiology uh, at Greensboro Moscon. Uh, runs a really large practice out there and has done some really cutting edge work with uh, the Baristim technology. Uh, very excited to have him out here today. Um, out of interest, it's just important to know that he's one of the only persons I know who's given an entire lecture without any slides because the slides failed the last time. So we're delighted that this time, hopefully, he'll have some slides. Perfect. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. So Dr. Singh mentioned to us already that, you know, we have limitations in electrophysiology. 70% of patients are not candidates for CRT. And as an electrophysiologist who likes to make patients feel better, that doesn't settle well with me. I, I want to take care of patients in a way that improves things. You know, I was talking to an electrophysiologist today, and he said, James, you know, I don't have access to this therapy. A patient is referred back to me on optimal medical therapy with a narrow QRS, and he says, I have to say, I hope you feel better. And that's all he's got. I hope you feel better. That's all he's got. You know, and so um, Dr. Fadim here today says we've got new therapy that can improve your exercise tolerance, can improve your quality of life, and your heart failure class. That's novel. A heart failure doctor here on stage telling us all these great things. It's great to be a part of this presentation today, and it's great to be in real life. I'm glad we're here, not virtual today, so I'm glad, glad that you're all here. So you might say, well, as an electrophysiologist, we're talking about a device that's not thoracic. It's implanted by a vascular surgeon in the operating room for heart failure. Why, as an electrophysiologist, do I want to be a part of this therapy? The reason is because we want to do more for our patients, right? We don't want to look at that patient in the eye and just say, I hope you feel better. We want to do more for that patient. That's why we're here, and that's why we're learning about this therapy, and, and, and that's why I'm really excited about this. And so hopefully you'll pick up on some of, the, some of this excitement as well. The first question, where do we get these patients? I'm an electrophysiologist. Where am I going to see patients that would benefit from this therapy that heart failure doctors are talking about? The first place we see these patients are our ICD patients. By definition, the majority of them have an injection fraction of less than 35%, and the majority of them have heart failure, and hopefully these are all patients on good medical therapy. These are patients that come to you in your practice every single day. Patients who might have CRT, but actually have not received benefit from therapy, are now patients that we could consider for this. Patients who are frequently hospitalized, Maybe these patients bounce back on your schedule after a recent hospitalization for an arrhythmia, heart failure decompensation, or other things, but these are patients to keep in mind. And then when you're having conversations with patients and they're talking about reductions in quality of life or activity, functional status, you know, I can't shower, I can't make my bed, I can't cook, I can't climb stairs, I can't do all the things I want to do, think bare reflexive activation therapy for that patient. Unfortunately, I think what we do too often is we see that patient and say, well, you know, he can't shop or travel like he used to. He's not, you know, he was playing golf five days a week. He's rarely going at all, but he's not sick enough for this therapy. I'm going to wait until he's on his deathbed. And that's not what we need to do. This is a therapy that really helps our patients. I'm going to show you a couple of cases today of how patients can do so much better with this therapy, but this is not a bridge to transplant. This is not an alternative to VAD. This is for our patients who have recent, you know, class three heart failure, maybe hospitalized and could have now class two heart failure, but they need to feel or want to feel better. They need more. This example is one that is probably one of my favorites. It's a 36-year-old gentleman with a familial cardiomyopathy. He has New York Heart Association class 3B symptoms. His ejection fraction is 15%. He's not had prior arrhythmias, but he can't tolerate medical therapy. You know, he's one of these guys, you see him all the time. His systolic pressure is 80s and 90s at best. He's frequently hypotensive when he stands. He's on Coreg 3.125 and like two and a half of lisinopril because that's all he can tolerate and really he can't tolerate that. So like he takes his Carvedilol on Mondays and his lisinopril on Tuesdays. He just cannot tolerate medical therapy because his heart's so sick. And he's got a narrow QRS. And you're looking at this guy and 
what you don't want to do is just say, I hope you feel better. You know, I can't, I can't give you more medicines. I don't have anything else. You don't have a wide QRS. Can't resynchronize you. I hope you feel better. He's tired. He's short of breath. He has intractable edema, and he's getting worse in front of you. This gentleman was implanted with, sorry, was implanted with a barrow uh, stem device, and we followed him up at three months. At three months, his class 3B symptoms had, in, had improved slightly to class 3, and he had a little bit less edema, but no marked improvements. We titrated his therapy at that time. We saw him back at six months. Now he's class 2. He's starting to feel better. His energy's better. And most importantly for this patient, his hypotension has resolved. So guess what we can do now? Now we can titrate his medical therapy. And so we start to put him on Entresto and we start titrating his beta blocker and all of these things. And at a year, this patient is New York Heart Association class one. His edema is completely resolved. His ejection fraction is 25 to 30%. And this was a dying man when we saw him at the beginning of the year. Sorry, sir, I hope you feel better, right? So this is huge. This is what we're talking about. This is an opportunity to really intervene and impact the lives of your patients in an amazing way. Another patient, 78-year-old female, she has a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Over the course of about three years, she had declined initially. So she had an ejection fraction of 40%. She had a CRTP device placed. And despite that, a year later, her ejection fraction has re reduced further to 30%. Her device was upgraded to CRTD. She's another one with, with a fair bit of pump failure. She had an, a simple atrial tachycardia and with that had syncope because her heart just could not tolerate any type of tachycardia. She did have an atrial flutter ablation. She was treated with medical therapy as tolerated. And in 2021, she underwent barrier stem implant. New York Heart Association class three symptoms, still having shortness of breath at first. She had AV node ablation due to ongoing arrhythmias. Her medicines were titrated. She did have ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, uh, which led to her bare stem implants subsequently thereafter. So the device was implanted. This is a very sick patient. Two months after implant, she's feeling a lot better. She's feeling great overall. Last short of breath episode was several months ago, and her energy is starting to improve. We up try up titrate her bare stem device. We're able to up titrate medicines further. And we see her at four months. At four months, she's New York, sorry, New York Heart Association class one, two, and she's had no further heart failure admissions. She's very happy. She's doing well. Again, a patient that we had done everything for, she had CRT. We had tried to optimize this device. We had done everything we could for this patient. Sorry, ma'am, I hope you feel better, right? But now we have new therapy and she's done really, really well. Where's another place that we can get device patients for this pr procedure coming out of electrophysiology? We mentioned this list right here. For me in my practice, a huge opportunity is within our ICM clinic where we look at thoracic impedances on a daily, daily rate. This is a patient, he's a, he's a good friend of mine. I've followed him for about 10 years now. He started out with substance-related cardiomyopathy, he had very little resources, he had basically cardiac cachexia, and he's just not done well for years. And basically for years, I've seen his core view look just like this. And we're up titrating, down titrating, doing what we can with medicines to try to help this gentleman. And he's had multiple admissions. And uh, towards the end of last year in July, um, we implanted him with a bare stem device. And, and, and the core view tells the story. You know, this gentleman had his device implanted in July, and as you can see, as we've titrated therapies, he's done amazingly well, amazingly well. And so this is exciting, and this is, for me, an objective finding. You know, when we talk about improved quality of life, when we talk about improved exercise tolerance, when we talk about improved New York Heart Association class, that's what patients care about, but sometimes we're a little bit, well, those are fuzzy a little bit sometimes, but when we see things like this, for me, it gives me a objective, hard endpoint to say, wow, we helped this man. So let's talk about the implant technique. So currently, the device is implanted in the OR by our vascular surgeon. That has been an amazing uh, collaboration for us. 
a really good teammate, and we've helped a lot of patients. They make a small incision in the neck and basically suture the, de the device, the electrode, right onto the carotid bulb, then tunnel the lead down to a pectoral pocket, and then close that, similar to as what you would do with an implanted uh, defibrillator type device. Again, this is done in the OR. Patients can go home the same day from this. It's a big deal. As an electrophysiologist, initially I would go in to make the pocket for the device, but over time I realized my vascular surgeon could do it just as well as I could. And so now he does these procedures himself from beginning to end and does an amazing job and has really bought into the process and has seen these patients get better and has realized their journey with me. There's a new procedure coming, right? Bat wire. This is an opportunity for percutaneous implantation of the device over a guide wire. So basically what would happen is using ultrasound techniques, we're able to, to uh, guide a wire right over the carotid bifurcation and then insert a lead in this location that we can then tunnel down to a pulse generator. This is an example of one of our cases. Uh, you can see in the top right picture that we're using ultrasound and we're able to guide our needle to the carotid bifurcation. And then we take a guide wire and follow that through an entry point and an exit point of the skin. And then over that, we're able to use our introducer to advance the lead to a location that we can confirm with ultrasound. It's then tunneled down to a pulse generator. And so now as an electrophysiologist, I can be even more excited about this technique, right? And this, this therapy for patients, because sure, my patients have another opportunity to feel better. We can improve their exercise tolerance, their quality of life, their New York Heart Association class. And now I can be a part of the procedure with the implant technique.